So, um, as, as Naomi mentioned, I just wanted to give you a quick couple of minutes. Um, as Naomi mentioned, Chasey Partners, we're, we're around the world, and um, I, I guess it provides us with an understanding of what is happening on the ground. We speak to and deal with quite a lot of people um, in terms of what's actually ha in, in terms of working with them, but also listening to what they're what, what they're saying to us. And of course, over the last 24 hours, I've heard quite, I've heard quite a lot of uh, remarks being made by people about how things are. And I wanted to share some of those thoughts with you because. Uh, about some of the trends that we see and definitely are experiencing. Um, and of course, many of them you would expect to hear about, so global, global business services, cross-functional shared services and, and, and outsourcing, captives, outsourcing, hybrid sourcing models, hub and spoke. There are many, but that's just naming just about a few at the moment. But, um, but what I want to really think about or, or, or get people's minds thinking about is the, the competitive dynamic which I think is driving most things at the moment or at least we think it is. We see things happening on the ground that we believe are making quite a difference. And you saw the SSN ON review there about 2012 and those are market conditions for example, things that are going on, some within the control or within our control if you like as organizations and some not. But one of the first things um, I can move this. Is this um, Europe and the global centers? I mean, we see a lot of emerging growth areas. Of course, in Europe, the Baltics are now providing uh, viable locations for, uh, for the Nordics. Bulgaria is getting on the radar. In the more central European regions, you see the tier two and three cities coming through, like Brno, the Gdansk Tri City region and eastern Poland. And then further afield is the classic centers, such as Bangalore, Delhi, Shanghai, and Manila. And these are now being favored as global centers. So these, these guys are really are getting into mass, mass production to a great extent. And then you have China making great efforts to, uh, to attract in um, going beyond the coastal regions, if you like, to become global destinations as they are in India and, and places like that at the moment. Then when you add in places like Sri Lanka, which is coming out, and then Johor in Malaysia, North and South Africa, then, then you really do have a global footprint. And I haven't even mentioned Latin America. So, I mean, there's almost nowhere in the world that is not accessible. And of course, a lot of this has been helped by technology, communications. Um, and then there have been some hiccups, for example, in Egypt um, there last year. Uh, people were reversing out of Egypt, but as soon as the conditions are right, I've absolutely no doubt that people will go back into Egypt because the ones that have been there have very good things to say about it. At the basic level, though, this is providing, you know, a lot of choice and a highly competitive environment. So it gives options, it gives location options at lower cost. And in, in fact, you might even say that the global business service model is one of the key drivers here because if you've got the two or two of the key elements of global business services, which is the integrated approach and the virtual service delivery, is actually making a much more compelling environment for these locations to actually exist. So on the one hand, you can applaud this and say the choice and is great and you can reap the opportunity, but likewise, this can be perceived as a threat, particularly by those more mature, nearshore uh, shared service and even uh, uh, outsourcing um, organizations in these locations, nearshore locations. However, as much as the lower cost is an advantage, should existing shared services be concerned about this? Perhaps. This kind of dovetails then into, into the next subject. So, if you have a lot of new locations coming out, it is arguable that this agenda is even more amplified. So we can see, for example, the benefits of process standardization. We live our lives around process standardization. It's one of the things that we constantly strive for, but we're actually ending up commoditizing what we do. We end up commoditizing transactional activities, and the result is then is that these processes are not only independent of location, but they're highly transportable. So in some ways, we're, we're writing our own destiny in this. I, I give you a very good example. I, I always use this because, I, I, although it's been going on for many years, Oracle set up a shared service center in Dublin back in the mid-90s, late 90s. At one stage, I think they had about 350 people. And I think the average payroll cost was whatever. It was a, a fairly low-cost location. Today, they have less than a third of the staff 
in Dublin, but their payroll bill is substantially higher. What it says about that is that Oracle moved a lot of stuff east, but then created a center of expertise and excellence in Dublin around global control. So there, there was an example, if you like, of an organization or a company taking advantage uh, of that situation. What we do see in terms of companies that are best equipped to take advantage of this is, first of all, they see the writing on the wall. They do something about it. And for sure, they look at turning a potential threat into an opportunity. They, they also equip themselves for it. They look at the people and the technology that they need to, to, to get up to speed with. And then they position their proposal really well and in the right way in their organizations to get the right kind of decision. This is really, really important. So in other words, you, you've, you've got this real proactive approach to selling shared services and the service delivery model within their own organizations. And then getting people to actually back them on it. And then, you know, uh, 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 somewhere along these lines as well, it, it kind of always surprises me then um, to see where we are on the captive versus outsourcing thing. Because there are very, you know, to me, I, what I find is that there are very strong sentiments that says that outsourcing can be a liberating force for a shared service organization. It can really help. And it can help on that diversification uh, angle. Um, what we, we definitely see many organizations taking advantage of selective outsourcing. There are companies who do wholesale outsourcing, but in the majority of cases, I would say that the service delivery model involves a combined insourcing and outsourcing model, the so-called hybrid that we're all fairly familiar with. But, you know, there's usually a lot of complexity in the decisions that are made behind any sourcing route that is taken, but one, th one thing that, that BPOs definitely do, uh, do really offer, I think, in this case, is that, I mean, they provide the services, we know that one, okay, around AP and AOR process and general ledger and so forth, but they provide products as well. So, for example, ready-made solutions around travel and expenses, for example. Why would we want to go and reinvent the wheel? And why do we need to have something that we need to have? Why do we need to make something when we can buy something? They bring capability. Statutory and tax compliance. We were doing it on Reuters from 2003 for 140 countries out of a shared service organization with the help of an external partner. And when, you, when you imagine the kind of rules involved in this, and the risks involved in this, it was a bit of a leap of faith, but now it's something that people are really embracing. Then, of course, they take uh, uh, advantage of lower costs, so that they are in cheaper locations or lower cost locations. So, for example, if I don't have the critical mass to be able to expand or go to geographies like China or India, I can certainly find someone who can take advantage of that for me, and I'll be reflected in what I'm charged. The other area here is this whole subject about outsourcing and innovation. It very much continues as a hot topic. I've been hearing this absolutely for years. But, but to me, there's, there's no doubt that many talented people work for outsourcing providers, and, and there is no shortage of innovation. But one could say that the best intentions shared by both the customer and the provider during the fashion show and the bidding process, I think they get it lost in translation a bit when it actually comes to the contract negotiation phase. So what starts out as a potentially good relationship, by the time the contract is signed, certain ways are embedded, and it tends to fossilize a little bit. But what I do find, or what we obviously find as well, is that where we see the successful relationships evolving is in the second time around. Not necessarily the first time, but the second time. And there's some very good examples hanging around, but what you'll find, I think, is that the, the issue here is um, it's not a matter of innovation but it's a matter of simply trust. So if you can get that trust thing working, then the innovation starts flowing. Finally, there's some other themes that we're noticing as well. Cloud keeps on coming up. Uh, I was at a conference last February in London. There was about 60 people in the room from various different companies, all well known. There was only one example of the cloud in the entire room. And you know what, what surprises me here is, you know, there's so many viable offerings now on the market. I myself set up a software as a service company back in 1999, and I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But even now, the, the traction to get that going. So I'm just wondering, is, is it a case of, why, you know, why are the adoption levels so slow as they are at the moment, or is it a dam about to burst? Because 
when you look at things around e-invoicing, for example, t and &E, oh, a lot, a lot of stuff, anything, a HR is, is, there's a lot of stuff in there as well. So there's a lot of opportunity. Then risk. Back in the mid-90s, we were outsourcing internal audit. It all had to come back in-house because of complications that arose out of the Enron scandal and so forth. But it's starting to happen again. And what we're also seeing as well, things like Treasury and credit risk management. I think it was last year that Union Bank of Switzerland, UBS, uh, were here receiving a prize for setting up a, a credit risk management uh, facility uh, in Poland, which was a real, quite, 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 quite a big step. And then there's, the, uh, there's another thing that we're seeing coming out of here as well, is um, outsourcing versus backsourcing. Um, what, what we mean by that is, is that, okay, you, you, you take something and you, you do certain things with it and then, you know, through a shared service organization and then you outsource it to somewhere in India or China or wherever, it doesn't really matter. But the issue is, is that, you know, the capability within your own organization, the knowledge is gone. And it creates this tension, if you like, where you have lost some links. And then what we see is that, that you have to kind of rebuild that. So we're wondering here, is this going to be an ongoing thing, or is it just a settling down thing? Anyway, just some thoughts to, uh, to, to, to get going.